let's go. So that we can have a bit of time for discussion. Hello everyone, thanks very much for coming on a Friday evening, 7 p.m. I think it's, uh, you should take that as a compliment. Uh, you know, um, we've tried, because of coronavirus, to not invite too many people. So <laughs> there is enough space for the germs to spread if that is what they would like to do. Uh, for, for me, it's an absolute pleasure to, uh, to welcome you uh, on behalf of uh, the SOAS Sound Engineering Institute and of course the Department of Law, uh, and in my case, the Department of Development Studies, uh, Kenneth Paul Nielsen today. Uh, he's currently an associate uh, professor at the University of Oslo's uh, Center for Development and the Environment. And before that, he got a degree, um, his master's is from uh, the University of Copenhagen in anthropology, and then he did a PhD in anthropology uh, from the University of Oslo uh, as well. Uh, I first became aware of his excellent work uh, when I read an essay of his on caste and class dynamics and the undercurrents of caste and class in the Shingun movement in uh, Bengal, uh, a militant protest against the CPM's policy of land acquisition. This was, in, in my view, an exemplary uh, piece of you know, deep and politically aware ethnography, and it introduced me to his extensive list of publications. Uh, which I confess I've not read the entirety of, and I think very few human beings will be able to. Uh, these writings, you know, I mean, his, his, if you go to his website, you'll find that his writings cover many themes which I think are very uh, much of interest to people here at SOAS uh, social movements, democracy, uh, caste, and caste, class and caste politics, uh, contention, he's by neoliberalism, industrialization, land acquisition. And also the politics of gender. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, he has more than 25 published articles, and he also writes extensively for Scandinavian newspapers. Uh, among his books, there are eight co-authored or co-edited volumes, of which I'd like to specially mention Women, Gender, and Everyday Social Transformation in India, which he wrote with Anne Wolfram. And a very intriguing book, which I've not read, but I'd like to, Cars, Automobility, and Development in Asia, Wheels of Change, with R. V. Hansen. And he's also uh, written with Alf Nielsen, another so-called friend of our department, uh, a book on social movements in the state of India. Uh, he's also written, Imagining uh, and Encountering the Indian State, Trust, Class, and Experience Among Kolkata's Urban Youth. I think that was perhaps your first uh, book, which was in uh, 2011. And more recently, it is written on land dispossession and everyday politics in rural India. So let's please welcome uh, Kenneth Paul Nielsen today as he talks about land use, planning, and contestation this time in Western India. Thank you so much, uh, Subir, for this uh, extensive introduction uh, and the many kind words. And thank you also to um, Philippe for uh, making this happen in spite of strikes and everything else. It's, it's, really, it's really nice to be here. Uh, back home, I work at a campus where everybody goes home at 4 p.m. sharp. So if you do anything after that time, you won't have an audience at all. So I'm very happy to see uh, so many people here. Thank you so much. Um, I, it's true, I started out in, in Eastern India, looking at land dispossession and social movements. Uh, over the past five years, I've kind of shifted to the other side of India, uh, working in Goa since uh, 2014. And basically, this, this talk builds on material from Goa. Uh, it's, uh, it's based on a very long paper that's uh, hopefully coming out in Journal of Peasant Studies later this year a special issue comparing land dispossession in India and China, co-edited by Mike Levian and Joe Andreas and a bunch of other people. Uh, so this is a co-authored work, uh, and I've tried to condense what is a very long paper into a presentation that hopefully won't last more than 45 minutes. If I go over time, Shabir, please uh, tell me to wrap up, and I'll try to move through the, the slides uh, quickly. If you see my phone flash twice like that, then... Right, okay, then I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll shut up. So, uh, without further ado, um, in, in 2015, uh, the inhabitants of this small coastal village in Goa, uh, called uh, Tirakor, were awakened by the arrival of men and machinery that were hired by leading hotel, <coughs> Private Limited, 
uh, a five-star hotel company. Uh, the machines that you see here uh, bulldozed a large part of the village orchard lands as part of leading hotels plans to build a new PGA standard golf course and resort on basically this uh, area. Villagers strongly opposed this project for many years, uh, triggering this attempt at leading hotels by sneaking in men and machinery at the dead of night, uh, protected by roughly 50 security guards. Now, prior to the arrival of men and machinery, this land in Tirokol had been contested for many years. Uh, the village is home, as you can see, to a colonial Portuguese fort that's uh, also a hotel. Um, it includes, uh, all in all, 16 different so-called survey plots of land, uh, according to official land records. Uh, the fort itself is survey plot number one, and the remaining land that you see here is mostly tenanted land owned by a local landlord. Most of the village lands were for long shown in official land use maps as cultivable or orchards. But things changed dramatically, at least on paper, when in 2006 this land suddenly appeared in official maps as a settlement area. The conversion of land in Tirocol from cultivation to settlement made the value of the land increase dramatically and was in effect the outcome of requests impressed upon the state government and authorities by a private consultancy. Anticipating the land use conversion that was coming in this area and the concomitant increase in its value, Margus Hotels and Real Estate, which is a subsidiary of leading hotels, moved swiftly and bought most of this land from the landlord. In current, oh sorry, and then the landlord in turn uh, paved the way for leading hotels by swiftly evicting most of his tenants. Now in official land use maps, most of Tirakon is now marked as an eco-tourism zone. Local opposition from these tenants notwithstanding uh, plans to build the hotel and the golf resort. Uh, that will cover almost the entire village and the village lands are alive and well. The course is designed by Colin Montgomery. There will be a marina and 115 uh, nice villas. So this presentation is not really about uh, Tidakon. It's not a localized case study of one land conflict. Uh, what I'll try to present is more sort of the bigger picture of uh, land use planning and its consequences uh, in the state of, of Goa. So this is more of a vignette, but the aim of this presentation in itself is rather to give sort of a bigger picture of land use plannings and its uh, fallouts in, in Goa. Now, as uh, we all know, land grabbing has become a contentious public issue in most part of the world uh, in recent uh, decades. And we have now a large and glowing literature on the global land grab or the global land rush, or whatever concept one prefers, that looks at how structural adjustments and neoliberal reforms and the openings of markets have been key drivers of uh, land grabbing that allows corporate entities to gain control of land and or its resources. Now in this context, India has, I think, been one of the global epicenters of land grab protests as controversial projects within the fields of infrastructure uh, real estate, as in the case here, uh, industry, mining, and as of late also solar energy and other renewables uh, have triggered popular protests in many different parts of the world. A key conceptual distinction within the land grabbing debate in India has, I think, been accordingly made between dispossession uh, as a directly coercive redistribution of landed wealth upwards, in which the state plays a key role, and on the other hand, the ongoing and market-induced dispossession that results from the dull compulsions of uh, everyday economic relations. And this is, of course, not a rigid distinction, and there's a long debate on whether one can, in fact, distinguish sort of the economic and the extra-economic drivers of dispossession from each other. But it's a distinction that has been debated and that has become influential in debates about land grabbing and dispossession um, in India. We also have a large literature that has looked at many of the mechanisms that are available to states, bureaucracies, and private investors uh, when it comes to rendering land available for private investors, such as leading hotels in this case. Uh, people have looked at um, 
the range of actors, the range of mechanisms, and the range of imaginaries that work to enable land dispossession in particular contexts. As this uh, short case illustrates, uh, this may include uh, machinery, as we see here, that bulldoze and raise lands, uh, security guards and coercive evictions that forcefully kick people off their land, but it may also involve the police and politicians and investors, small-time land brokers and petty officials in control of land records and land conversion processes. And of course, the systematic manipulation of all kinds of information. Land dispossession also relies on what Tanja Lee calls inscription devices. That is, those devices that are mobilized to establish forms of exclusion from land and to distinguish legitimate from illegitimate users and to inscribe boundaries onto space. Lee acknowledges the importance of mundane and everyday inscription devices, uh, such as axes and spades and plows and shovels. But she also pays particular attention to statistical picturing devices and graphic forms that render land investable. And these may include uh, maps, title deeds, tax registers, graphs and satellite images that enable land to be manipulated from a distance. Now, unlike many other land conflicts in India, uh, protests centered on land in Goa have specifically focused on the regional land use planning processes in the state. In this paper, uh, we look at regional planning in Goa, and particular the regional planning documents that comes out of this process as inscription devices that are implicated in processes of land dispossession at the state level. As the Tirocol case demonstrates, uh, land use map and all kinds of official land classifications or zonings, as they are called in Goa, and the production and circulation and manipulation of these zoning categories are important parts of the processes that pave the way for land dispossession to take place in a specific uh, location. As such, we look at plans and planning processes as microcosms of contested terrains and as a kind of condensation of society's condensations over, uh, contestations over uh, space. So at the risk of uh, simplifying what is in fact a very complex relationship forming around land in Goa, uh, we try to show in this paper that in the Goan case, planning appears as a terrain of struggle between, on the one hand, uh, an alliance between state and big capital that seeks to dispossess and convert land, and on the other hand, a more or less organized citizenry that seeks to use planning for alternative purposes. So in that sense, the dialectic between manipulative planning from above and popular mobilization around planning processes is sort of at the, at the heart of this presentation. These opposing social forces that play out on the domain of land and land use planning. So what I hope to show now in more or less convincing ways um, is that the long-term trend in regional planning in Goa has been one in which planning documents and planning processes have functioned overwhelmingly as devices that facilitate the assembling of land for private investments, even as the very same planning process, especially when it's been combined with popular mobilization from below, has also provided important opportunities for citizens to contest and reshape land governance in alternative ways. At times, such popular mobilization has been spectacularly successful in exposing and putting an end to manipulative planning from above. And yet, by charting the creation, evolution, contestation, and unraveling of many different successive plans for Goa, we argue that although regional plans were introduced to manage the state's resources in sustainable ways, they have gradually and in a piecemeal way been enlisted into an elite project that seeks to commodify land along the lines of what we've seen in Tirocol and in other places. So, based on this, we, we hope to make sort of three, uh, three contributions to, to debates on land and dispossession uh, in Goa. Uh, the first is, in a sense, an empirical contribution, because we, as far as we are aware, do not have much systematic work on Goa's now more than three decades of experience with statewide land planning. So we think the empirical narrative is, in a sense, a contribution in its own right 
to the land grab uh, debate. We also uh, try to use Goa as a diagnostic case, and we do that very tentatively uh, in light of statements from the central government that one of the solutions to the many land conflicts we've seen in India over the past decade and a half might be found in a more systematic, more encompassing form of state-led land use planning. Now, Goa has had a statewide land use planning policy for nearly three decades, and it has perhaps India's most enlightened and tech-savvy and well-educated civil societies. So perhaps the Goa case will illustrate what the fallouts might be if we have more centralized, more encompassing state planning, and also what it might demand from social movement when it comes to uh, steering such planning processes uh, along the lines of more popular participation in effective ways. Now, the last uh, contribution we hope to make, and this is where sort of the, the, the paper's place in this special issue maybe comes out a bit more clearly, is to think about uh, planning as inscription devices inspired by Tanya Lee and aligning that with Mike Levin's arguments about regimes of dispossession in the Indian context. Now, um, Levin uses the concept of regimes of dispossession to refer to a political apparatus that coercively redistributes landed wealth upwards. In other words, he uses, and I might quote him, the concept to highlight variation in the robbers and what they do with their loot. That's basically what the regimes of dispossession concept intends to do. Um, we try to align this argument with looking at planning as one of the mechanisms through which land is dispossessed and subsequently com commodified and put on the market. And I would like to hear, of course, eventually your views on whether this is a constructive, fruitful alignment or whether you see any problems in, in bringing these different frameworks together. So uh, please bear this in mind. Um, now, I won't give you much context to the question of land dispossession uh, in neoliberalizing India. I assume this will be perhaps a phenomenon that's um, well known to most of you. So I think I'd rather jump straight to the particular context of uh, Goa. And I took the liberty of putting eight finger Eddie in the top right corner because that might be the kind of person that one, uh, at least uh, sitting in uh, the UK or Norway, the first things about when one thinks about Goa as this uh, tourism tourism paradise where, where people go for holidays and, and parties and to relax and enjoy, which is also partly true. Uh, but there are many other things going on. And Goa has uh, been home to a number of controversies concerning land and its uses uh, dating back at least to the early 1960s when we saw the first sort of escalation of iron ore mining in the hinterlands of the state in the areas bordering the, the Western Ghats. Uh, there are many drivers today uh, that drive processes of land commodification and dispossession in the state. Uh, one of them is, of course, uh, tourism. Uh, ever larger areas are sought to be converted into resorts uh, for tourist purposes. Uh, there's a much longer history of iron ore mining in the hinterlands, uh, which has been suspended for some years now, but which is set to resume in all likelihood before too long. Uh, this is a sort of standard mining landscape from the interiors of, of Goa. Uh, there's now massive infrastructure development. There's a new international airport coming up. And uh, I was there just a couple of weeks ago, and the, the amount of work that's put into widening the highways across the state is just unbelievable. I mean, it's sort of one big construction space, particularly uh, the highways that run in a west-east direction, uh, because the state is now a major hub for imported coal coming from Australia and uh, South Africa, which is then driven through the state into Karnataka to feed the steel industry. Uh, enormous amount of uh, infrastructure development and also the railways are expanding as well. And then there are of course the, the industries that have a longer history in, uh, in Goa. And just to give you some, some indicators, this is a graph of iron ore exports from the state. Uh, Goa being the main point of export of iron ore from India for many years. Uh, here we have the preparation for the Beijing Olympics, which registered a dramatic increase in iron ore exports, mainly to China, 
Uh, we have land acquisitions uh, for industrial estates uh, at a very low level for many decades, and then picking up rap very rapidly uh, around uh, the accelerating economic liberalization, late 80s, early 1990s. Uh, and of course, tourism and a growing number of uh, houses in Goa that stand uh, empty most of the year, which are holiday homes for uh, wealthy Indians and also for, for Westerners who, who have uh, homes that they hardly ever use. So, um, to return to the analytical framing that we work with. Um, we are inspired by the regimes of dispossession debate initiated by uh, Mike Levian, and because he's also co-editing this issue, there's been a kind of a gentle pressure on us to engage that thinking to some extent in more or less creative ways. And I think this is a good space to be open about this, uh, because uh, that sort of maybe invites uh, another kind of debate, if, if that's clarified, I think, earlier on. Um, so we follow Levian and also Hall in questioning the relevance of concepts uh, such as primitive accumulation and accumulation by dispossession, uh, the relevance of these at the current uh, conjuncture. Uh, Hall, on his part, is very explicit about the confusion that arises when different authors use these concepts in very many different ways, foregrounding variously either characteristics or consequences or intentions that underpin these processes. Now, Levian is perhaps more dismissive and simply asserts that land grabbing at a stage of advanced capitalist development requires an altogether different set of concepts than what is offered by classical Marxism. And he begins by picking up on Harvey's work on accumulation by means other than expanded reproduction, ABD in other words, uh, seeing that as a step forward but still dismissing it as somehow too vague, too capital-centric and too all-encompassing to be of any use when it comes to understanding specific cases of dispossession in particular contexts. So what Levian tries to forward is a theory of how and why and when extra economic coercion and transparent state force, in a sense, become defining features of dispossession. That's, in a sense, what interests him, which one might say is a very narrow field of interest, but also a very perhaps clearly defined field of interest. Now, to account for why a state is willing to dispossess certain people for certain purposes at certain conjunctures and with references to certain normative reasons, as well as the extent to which a state is, is more or less successful in doing so, um, he gives us the concept of regimes of dispossession that he defines as a socially and historically specific constellation of state structures, economic logics that are tied to class interests, and ideological justification that generates consistent patterns of dispossession. It's a very long definition, but that's more or less sort of the way he looks at a regime of dispossession. Simply put, he says, India has seen a transition from an older Nehruvian developmentalist regime of dispossession, uh, where the state would dispossess land for big dams, steel towns, some of the well-known examples from his works, and to a more neoliberal regime of dispossession where the state is willing to dispossess, dispossess people for very different reasons in a neoliberalizing setup where private capital plays an increasing role in the political economy. Now he speaks on the one hand of a new pan-Indian neoliberal regime, uh, but his empirical work, which is located in Rajasthan, I think, um, points to a more specific state-level regime of dispossession, where such regimes are constituted by historically distinct and more state-specific processes within a broader federal state system. Now, when one scales regimes in this way, I think one can potentially look at, comparatively, to highlight variation in the robbers and what they do with their loot, as Levian says, uh, both across temporal and spatial axes. I mean, one can look at a chronology, uh, transitions from one regime of dispossession to another, or one can compare synchronically uh, different regime existing at the same time at different uh, state levels in different states in India. Uh, 
So it's against this kind of thinking that we argue for the central role of land use planning as one means of looting within a Goan state-specific regime of disposition. And I'm very open to discuss this subsequently, but this is sort of the starting point that we have, that scaling these regimes at a state level hopefully opens up for some kind of comparison uh, at a lower level of scale than the nation state, which I think might be a sensible way of, of looking at this. So as specific forms of inscription devices, planning documents and land use maps, and all these classifications and graphs and charts and tables that make up these plans do not merely represent space and do not merely describe the space that exists within a state. They are prescriptive to the extent that they hold a certain power to create and convey authority over territory. They carry the weight of law and state machinery and they have real effects in real contexts, as the Tyrical case illustrated, I think. At the same time, that, which we also try to show, uh, they are contested terrains. Once plans are made, once they're made public, they can be contested, challenged, appropriated, and rewritten multiple times in response to the workings of different social forces, including those that emanate from social movements from below. So, that's kind of the, the groundwork. And now we move over to uh, the more Goa-specific uh, cases of the experience with uh, planning. Goa is, I think, unique in the Indian context. It is, as far as I know, the only Indian state that has a spatial plan that covers the whole state. The idea dates back to 1964, when the town and country planning department was set up uh, to develop the state in a planned manner. And this is the 1960s, state-led planning. Later in 1964, uh, the Goa government passed the so-called Goa, Daman and Diu Town and Country Planning Act, which empowered the local government to create a regional plan for the whole state where development could only be on, could be undertaken without compromising the natural resource base of the state. Under this act, Goa was to have a chief town planner, who sits here in Panjim, whose task it was to integrate uh, the plan that was to be made with a so-called land use plan that covered the whole surface of Goa state. The function of the plan was, in a sense, to tr uh, of the land use plan was to translate the abstract planning priorities into a concrete land use plan for the whole state. Um, it took the form of a zoning plan that demarcated all areas for different human uses, including agriculture, forestry, industry, settlement of various kinds, and so forth. Now, once this statewide demarcation exercise was complete and the land use plan was notified, uh, the zoning of land for these different purposes was fixed. And no development could be carried out in these zones that contravened uh, the zoning category of that particular plot. And to ensure a stability of the plan, it was decided that they, these could not be changed for five years. The plans were fixed and could not be changed for a five-year period. Not until 1981 did the actual process of creating the first regional plan actually begin. And this process began in 1981. And the plan that was to be created was called the Regional Plan for 2001. And I will use that word now, the Regional Plan 2001, but bear in mind that this gets moving in the 1980s. So with an eye on having a plan that is supposed to be in effect until 2001. Through such planning exercises that began in the 1980s, Goa has now had three different regional plans. RP 2001, notified in 1986, RP 2011, notified in 2006, and RP 2021, notified in phases between 2010 and 2011. All these plans have had different sub-objectives, but they've also all had the overarching uh, official goal of balancing economic growth with environmental protection and the protection of agricultural lands. And I will see to what extent they've been successful in achieving this. 
So the formal planning architecture in Goa, as I mentioned, dates back to the early 1960s and gradually evolves to the early 1980s when the planning process begins. So it has roots, in a sense, in Nehruvian thinking about the role of planning within the Indian nation state. Uh, on the other hand, the notification of the first plan, which happens in 1986, is in the midst of a liberalizing period under uh, Rajiv Gandhi that accelerates uh, subsequently towards 1991 and beyond. So we have a planning process that comes out of the Nehruvian era but gets implemented in the middle of increasing liberalization with interesting consequences, I think. So when the first plan is notified in 1986, that's RP 2011. Uh, the idea was that the plan and its land use map would be frozen until at least until 1991. That didn't happen. Um, there was a growing demand for land from many of these uh, sectors we saw earlier, uh, mining, infrastructure, tourism, all these sectors in a liberalizing setup where possibilities were growing. Uh, so within two years of the plan being notified, uh, we have a provision being made uh, to the plan that opens off the possibility for accommodating private requests for changes to the zoning of particular plots of land. More specifically, an amendment uh, made by the State Assembly in Goa uh, empowered the Town and Country Planning Board to change the land use plan at any time it so fit. Um, <coughs> in response to requests made by the public. That, in effect, eliminated in, eliminated in one stroke the idea of no changes for five years by this uh, small insertion. Following this amendment, a modus operandi would be that land use changes uh, or requests for changes in zoning of particular plots of land would be made to the town and country planning department which would then uh, notify, uh, would, would either approve or reject this request. If it was approved, uh, the proposed zone change was made public in the Gazette, and if no objections were received to this change, uh, it would then be notified once more in the Gazette as effectuated. So this, in a sense, is a modality of changing the uses to it which land can be put uh, by stealth that we know from many other Indian contexts, uh, which is in a sense a kind of informality from above where land use uh, is changed through discretionary means that do not generate much public attention. I mean, even not many people, I think, read the official Gazette all that often. And, and even if they, if one is an avid reader of the Gazette, I think it, one needs to be a detective in order to piece all these small zoning changes into a bigger picture of what's actually happening to land on a higher scale in the context of Goa. This is a table that uh, one cannot, uh, of course, uh, at all read. Um, but I put it up in any case. So, 1998 is when the amendment is made to the Town and Country Planning Act that enables these zoning changes by itself. And here we have the number of changes that are requested per year. Uh, it goes on up to 2005. A total of more than 2,000 requests are made for changing uh, land zoning. Uh, the overwhelming amount of changes relates to land being converted from something else to settlement, which I think is, is an indication of land being used for uh, real estate and also for uh, tourism-related facilities. And also a good number of new industrial projects are coming up in, in this period. Um, so, so this is in a sense an, an option that exists for a full uh, 17 years. It results in more than 20 square, uh, 12 square kilometers of land being rezoned. That doesn't sound like much, but in the context of Goa, it's actually a fair amount of land that is being converted from uh, mainly agriculture and to something else. Now we know a good, and this is there's more about this in the paper, uh, the ways in which uh, the town and country planning ministry 
is probably after the office of the chief minister. It's the most wanted ministry in Goa. Uh, enormous discretionary powers reside with the minister when it comes to rezoning land. And there have been a number of uh, very large uh, corruption exposures related to that department that have shown how sort of land conversions have been used in a transactionalist manner between uh, politicians and their sponsors and the electorate and different interests. Uh, we have more in the paper and of course it's, it's always with these things, it's hard to know what are the rumors and what are the facts, but, but the, the rumors are at such a scale that uh, uh, we have quite solid indications that, that uh, many things have been happening in, in this ministry. Uh, this practice of, of uh, converting land by stealth between different categories only stops in uh, 2005 when Goa is put on the president, president's rule. It was actually the governor that ordered the practice to be stopped. So it stops in 2005 following these uh, large exposures also driven by uh, activists uh, and environmentalists in, in Goa. Now, the two following regional plans uh, would generate much more popular protest um, compared to this first one where one had this practice going on for close to two decades with protest being limited to a relatively small number of civil society uh, activists. Now, we move on to the next regional plan, RP 2011. And work on this plan began in the late 1990s. Uh, it was outsourced to a Delhi-based private firm called Consultancy Private Services, who then submitted a draft of this plan in, 20, uh, in 2005, a draft of the plan. Now, this draft version of the land use plan was then open for public comments from November 2005 until August the following year. When that deadline passed, uh, it was notified as the final regional plan. So we have here a phase between a draft being presented and a final plan being uh, passed and made final. And there's an opening here of some 10 months when the public can make comments and requests to that initial draft plan. Now, what we have here, I think, is a what we see with this plan is another modality of intervention in the planning process uh, by people in the town and country planning department. That is similar to the one which we had in the earlier regional plan, but still somehow different. Rather than attempting to stealthily change the plan once it had been finalized, attempts were made to use the opening of some 10 months when the plan was only in a draft stage. Um, uh, to rezone land in response to requests made by different investors. Now, zoning changes were thus woven into the drafting process but kept out of public view. And in the Tiracol vignette that I opened with, uh, we know that a consultancy called Hansel Goa Private Limited was involved in requesting that the survey numbers in Tiracol were converted uh, from orchard to settlement zones. And the same consultancy were directly involved in many other conversions during this window of opportunity. Now, the draft regional plan had in itself proposed to increase the area that was zoned for settlement by more than 11% when compared to the old regional plan. But when the plan was then notified as final, there had been an additional increase in 21% in the settlement area in the state. I mean, almost triple what had been envisioned in the draft. These included conversions of prime real estate locations in picturesque areas, hill slopes, agricultural lands, and seaside areas. And we have a couple of cases here. This is not the best resolution, but this is uh, the land use uh, plan for in the draft plan for Goa 2011. And this is the final plan overlaid from the draft plan. And all the red areas you see on this map are settlement areas that somehow appear out of the blue between the draft and the final plan. And this is considerable. And where are these in increased areas? They are all basically along the coast, many of them in, in the areas where 
tourism industry is located and where people want their holiday homes, basically. This is another case from the very popular Baga Beach. Uh, the idea is, uh, is the same. Uh, these red areas that suddenly emerge along the coast are increased settlement areas. So this is, uh, <laughs> this green patch here suddenly appears as a settlement area uh, coming uh, out of draft plan to the final plan. And lastly, the plan also uh, operated with a fourfold uh, increase in mining areas that also somehow appeared out of the blue between the draft plan and the final plan. Um, again, this is in Thomas mining belt for those of you who The red areas, basically. Now, in light of the growing public awareness of how the earlier plan had been tampered with, uh, within weeks of the notification of this final plan, Many civil society groups and individuals began studying the corresponding land use plan and raised apprehensions about these large-scale changes that had been made to the final version. Now, I think indeed the main difference between the earlier plan and this new plan that I think enabled uh, a much bigger social mobilization uh, centered on the planning process was that whereas the earlier manipulation of the first plan had taken place step by step over nearly two decades, here we had an opening of 10 months during which a large number of conversions were effected in a very short time span. And we had much better maps, which I think also enabled uh, tech savvy activists to more quickly piece together a picture of what's actually happening when it comes to land use in the state and the diversion of land from agriculture to other uses. Again, as I mentioned, real estate developers and the mining industry were identified as the main beneficiaries of these land conversions. Uh, and this time we had a much broader social mobilization that brought into its ambit not just a handful of dedicated activists, but a much broader base uh, of civil society. And this coincided by and large with the mobilization against special economic zones in Goa. So one had a sort of dynamics of mobilization, many different things coming together uh, at once. It ended with so much controversy that this plan was repealed. It was annulled and taken off the table. And when that happened, the old plan once again came into effect. So this means that the Tiropol land, which had suddenly become settlement land in this plan, to the benefit of a hotel group, now reverted to being orchards on which nobody could build the hotel. So suddenly, <coughs> The land in Tirocol had no value for the developer. Now, to speed things up, and now it becomes as if this wasn't complicated enough, it becomes even more complicated with the 2021 plan. And uh, what happens now is uh, perhaps too complicated to explain. Uh, to avoid controversy, now we've had two failed regional plans where different departments have sought to manipulate it, enlisted somehow in elite projects of freeing up land for private investors. Now, to avoid controversy, one attempts to bring on board activists in the planning process uh, to make sure that the design of these plans is truly participatory. This partly works. Uh, all new kinds of zoning categories are created. Uh, there's mass participation on a higher level than ever before. Uh, high resolution maps are generated uh, and taken to all village panchayats who then match these maps with the physical landscape and then provide feedback to the planners and ask for um, changes or confirm that the zoning corresponds with actually existing things on the ground. Um, again, we have a kind of a peculiar situation where new land zoning categories are suddenly introduced. Nobody really knows what kind of land belongs in which category. Along the way, new categories are invented within existing categories and land mysteriously shuffled from one category to another uh, and openings made. So that the Tiracol land, which in the draft regional plan 2021, uh, exists as an ecologically sensitive no development zone, suddenly appears in the final plan as an eco-tourism zone. 
because that's opened up within the ecological sensitive land category. One includes ecotourism zones. So again, the Tiroko land goes from being orchards to being an ecotourism zone, which, lo and behold, uh, results in uh, this kind of design for, for Tiroko. This is sort of the 150 villas that are supposed to come up uh, on this land. Uh, I have more in this here, but I think it's it's probably too uh, it's probably too much. I think. Um, <laughs> you do have around thirty. So right. Uh, I can't see that. I really I don't fully comprehend this plan myself. I mean, it's so <laughs> complicated, you know. And uh, what what's striking is that that while you have the panchayats uh, going around with high resolution maps to check whether things are depicted the way they actually are on the ground. Uh, you have the Town and Country Planning Board inventing entirely new zoning categories and shuffling land between categories uh, from more to less protected, uh, which uh, creates uh, another controversial situation in the sense that they end up having to freeze this plan. I mean, it, it's not implemented. Uh, the problems are too many and the protests are, are too much. So, uh, in a sense, what we try to show is that with this plan, uh, sort of the ability of various departments and ministries to manipulate the planning process in a way that allows them to free up land uh, for non-agricultural purposes, that kind of grinds to a halt. Uh, the protests have been too many. Uh, the activists are too good at, at what they do. Uh, illicit ways of inventing new categories doesn't really work anymore. And it certainly doesn't free up land on the scale that's required uh, when it comes to the different demands that investors have in Goa. So what we see now, I think, uh, is, is kind, of a, kind of a fourth phase in the planning process where new attempts are being made to, to circumvent the planning process altogether. And it happens in different ways. Uh, I mean, amendments are made to the act that guides uh, planning exempting all government projects from the planning process. Basically, the government can do what they want as long as it's a government project on land. There's also a reintroduction of the old clause that gives full discretionary power to the town and country planning minister to uh, approve of zoning changes on a case-by-case -case basis. We filed right to information uh, petitions asking in, for insights into what is the basis for some changes being granted and what is the basis for some changes not being granted, but we have not been given uh, any answer to this. And then we have the tabling of other acts that uh, supersede or fully sideline the role of planning in determining land use. Uh, Gova has an investment promotion act that allows uh, things to be fast-tracked and approved relatively quickly. And we have these two new acts uh, with probably, they probably sound pretty good, no? compensation to affected persons and so on. Uh, but in effect, these two, they represent an undoing, I think, of the 2013 Land Acquisition Act and a more or less a return to some of the basic tenets of the old 1894 Land Acquisition Act that gave the state much more power uh, to acquire land as it saw fit. Um, so uh, this is sort of where, where the planning story ends in a way, uh, with four different phases of planning being first enlisted in various ways to free up land for commercial purposes, and then more recently sort of new attempts at, at sidelining the whole planning process uh, altogether. Um, so just to, to quickly uh, wrap up, um, planning uh, in the Goan context I think stands out as a key instrument used to convert rural land into private real estate and attractive investor locations. In this sense, I think planning has been an integral part of the evolution since the early 1980s of a distinct neoliberalizing Goan regime of dispossession. Although Goa's planners crafted the state's planning architecture during the era of a more developmentalist regime of dispossession under Neruvian socialism, the workings of the actual inscription devices that eventually flowed from this architecture could be, to a large extent, aligned effectively with the interests of state and private capital in a neoliberalizing context through different modalities of intervention in the planning process from above. As such, um, the Goan regional planning process has been increasingly geared towards the production, circulation, and grounding 
of inscription devices that facilitate land disposition and commodification. Now these shifting modalities were shaped by the nature and contents of earlier plans, by the capacity of different departments to enlist the plans and the planning process in a larger project of altering land use in the state, by the degree of mobilization of counter forces in civil society, and of course by the larger political economy of land. Although planning and its inscription devices begin by altering and manipulating land from a distance, there are always tangible local implications. Within a span of just a few years, the Tiropol backwater went from comprising largely talented cultivated land and orchards to becoming a prime real estate and golf location targeted by global investors. Then, overnight, it reverted to cultivable land of little value to investors before it then re-emerged Phoenix-like Phoenix -like as a prime eco-tourism site that was made physically transfer transformable by a large team of security guards and heavy machinery. Now, while we in the paper acknowledge the important role of popular mobilization in shaping the planning process, we also note the ability of different elites to introduce ever new modalities of intervention and new inscription devices backed by the force of law, which in spite of temporary setbacks and concessions uh, ensured that the uneven trajectory of regional planning generally aligned with elite interests. Now given that land and land questions are politicized to a very high degree in Goa and that the state has a highly organized and vibrant civil society, the ability of elite interests to effectively manage dispossessive practices raises broader questions about the capacity of India's institutions to manage and mediate contested land use practices. In India, policymakers at many levels now claim that the solution to the contradictions and contestations that arise from multiple claims and often conflicting claims to scarce land can be found in more comprehensive and more systematic spatial planning. While such a new planning setup is yet to emerge, I think the results of the Goan experience with encompassing spatial planning spanning three decades may indicate that the outcome of such an endeavor is unlikely to be a resolution of India's land question. It may, as Tirukol and many other cases show, rather produce new forms of dispossession and contestation in the years to come. Thanks very much, Kevin. Uh, it's modeling, so as to take questions in trees. I don't know where this tradition has come from. But, you know, there we are. Uh, so, as you collect your thoughts, I just give some initial responses to your talk. Uh, as usual, you know, uh, fascinating material. I just want to have a couple of, uh, you know, clarifications, maybe. In your first slide, there looks like a heritage building on your, on the right. And I thought these were protected uh, in some sort of a special category, where the transfer of heritage uh, properties was not so straightforward. So I'm just wondering if what that, what does it do to situations in which land use is being legally changed uh, when there are heritage or protected you know properties within that? For example, this being a I think old colonial Portuguese building, I think this would be part of that. Uh, and this uh, slightly connected with that, um, I mean, you know, from what we know, there's a lot of criminality in all of this. Uh, and, you know, Goa is not uh, unique in a kind of a mafia type of situation in which you have, as you said, showed some people's photograph that I don't want to you know, necessarily say that they belong to them. But, you know, the kind of collusion between mysterious money, local uh, sort of mobsters, and politicians of all parties who freely move from one political party to another. So it's not so much the state as much as it is individual politics, maybe the state, but also individual you know, politicians who play that role of mediating between one form of land use and the uh, transition of that to something else. Is that people are inviting to also come to take similar questions? Would you like to ask? Yeah, I, have, I mean, I have a few questions, so, um, but uh, primarily some of it is related to maybe more recent trends, um, so I'm not sure whether it's necessarily covered in your work at this point, but I'm just curious in terms of um, how you would see, for example, when you're talking about the 
by legalization, how you would see that being as um, weakened or or potentially set back by the the challenges around internet shutdowns and blackouts and the challenges around communication, um, and whether that has any bearing or not on on the situation there. Also, in, in terms of newer trends, um, kind of whether the, in terms of the state planning, how you see overlay of the Belt and Road projects and whether that has much influence. Um, and um, yeah, and I guess um, just lastly in terms of, um, oh, I guess in terms of also like newer trends, whether along the sort of shorelines where a lot of the development is happening, whether you see that as um, some of it being even more, um, let's say, Becoming even more um, challenging with uh, climate, the climate crisis, and how that marginalizes communities and, and, and creates challenges for the kind of that planning. Thank you. And if there are questions left in the I can't understand the lesson you see if you find the figure that I can't actually see them. Yes, Start with the sh machines of dispossession, a uh, concept I actually quite like. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I think, so in a sense, your, your figures bore, bore out as well that there has been a major change in the way land was acquired before or after new liberalization. And, and so the standard mark is that before that it was mainly for profit purposes, after that it was mainly for profit. Mm -hmm. So that takes me to, to my question. Because I, I, I actually thought that, that legally you, uh, you couldn't change, you couldn't convert land use from one purpose to another unless there was a public purpose um, reason for it. I, I, I naively thought that you couldn't formally do it mm -hmm. in India if it was just to increase profits uh, for, for development. And that that was uh, sort of Indian legislation and not state. Uh, based mm -hmm. station that, 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 that there were rules around this. Mm -hmm. so, so I'm asking, am I wrong? Is it, can you, mm -hmm. as a state, do whatever you want uh, and change land use as you as you want to? Um, uh, or or is, 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 does there have to be an argument around public purpose uh, 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 benefits, uh, 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 public benefit related? Uh, uh, argument in order for land use changes to take place, and, and if that is the case, how is that done going? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, there is a lot of, 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 of land use uh, conversion taking place. Uh, I'll come back to you first in the next slide. Okay, thank, thank you so much. These are really great questions. Um, um, so let me just look at my notes. Um, so the, the heritage, I, I, will, I'm a bit of, I don't really have an answer to this. That, that fort is a survey plot of its own. And I would, would seriously think that they are not going to raise that fort and build another villa on top of that. Um, but exactly whether heritage is a particular zoning category, I'm actually not sure, uh, so I don't really have an answer to that question. But I would assume that that kind of structure was protected. Um, it's a hotel. I mean, you can stay there if you want. So whether it might be a hotel within another hotel, I mean, who knows what that construct might look like. Um, uh, just to the regimes of dispossession before I return to your questions. Uh, yes, when I showed Mike this graph, no, he was th thrilled huh? because that really sort of uh, <laughs> supports this idea that we have a shift no? in, in acquisition. I have another project that's where I'm trying to look at, uh, I don't know how many cassettes we have in Goa since 1961, 30,000 maybe, huh? uh, tracing all the different uh, land acquisition notifications to see whether there's actually a transition. And working my way back from here, towards 1991, there's still an awful lot of land being acquired for a playground, public park, uh, public sector irrigation extension, all the, sort of, all, all the old stuff that you would acquire land for. Uh, 
So uh, I, I too like that concept of a regime of disposition. I think it's good to think with. Uh, we only have, according to Mike, one transition. So based on that, it's difficult to theorize about a transition if you only have one. <laughs> um, but I think intuitively there's a lot in it that I, I really like. Um, maybe just to clarify, uh, in, when it comes to a zoning change, uh, it's not an acquisition. It's a change of zone, and I didn't say this, but the practice has been uh, from investors because they know that getting land converted is a thing you can do if you pay what the, the rate. No? Uh, so they purchase the plots they need on the assumption that when they go to the TCP, they will get that conversion of orchards into settlement. Uh, so there's, it, it's a way of sort of... Um, that's the order of things. You have a market transaction first, and then you have a zoning change. So there's no direct dispossession. What, what, what people lose is the increase in value that flows from the conversion of one zoning to another. Uh, I should have been clear about that. I think that that's, uh, probably uh, was a, a mission on my part. Um, thanks for all these questions. Uh, there's a, a lot to follow up on. Um, what I think has been the case, I was in Goa just last, last month, and um, rather than internet closure, which has not been a big thing there, I think it's, it's activism fatigue. Uh, people are <laughs> yeah. tired, uh, and also because many of these, as you see in the, in the planning process, people have many partial victories along the way, but it's rather rare that the big battle is won. Huh? And it's a, you have a very limited number of activists who are extremely busy because they are involved in all of this. Huh? Tourism, coal, mining, roads, airports, everything, huh? forests, rivers. Uh, and it, it becomes too much after some time. You know, people, they run out of steam apart from some very dedicated ones. So I think more than censorship, it's probably the fatigue and also an increasingly assertive government, I would say. There's a BJP state government. The former chief minister was also uh, minister of defense at one point and was a very powerful Goan chief minister. Um, um, the shoreline. Yes, good question. Climate change. Uh, the big thing uh, I saw on that now that's produced by government of India, I think. So it's their own damn map, so <laughs> they should. I mean, the. Uh, Climate change and rising sea levels, it's not going to affect the coastlines as much as you might think, but it affects the rivers. And much of this is very low-lying land, huh? some of it reclaimed, uh, the Kassan lands, they're called. And along the riverbank, that's where the big threat is, not so much the coastal area. So you might actually have a tourism sector that can sustain itself in spite of climate change. But where the sort of areas where people live along the rivers, they might be more in danger than, than the coastal zones. Uh, Belt and Road, uh, not particularly important in its own right in India, but what has been important is the Bharatmala and the Sagarmala, uh, two big uh, union government projects that push for land-based infrastructure and also the development of uh, ports and seaways. So what's happened is that there are plans afoot to, I mean, to nationalize the, the riverways and in that sense bring them under the control of the union government and not the state. And there are big expansion plans at the biggest port in Goa, which is Mormogao, a very important port, which is now a, a hub for coal coming in to Western India. For now, for the steel factories in Karnataka, but who knows, eventually also perhaps for many of the privately run coal-based thermal power plants that are coming up. Uh, so far, not so many in this area, but, but we have them up in Gujarat and there are in Tamil Nadu and, and Andhra Pradesh. So, um, not Belt and Road, but sort of Indian equivalence of the same kind of thinking, I think, has an impact there. 
planning system, and you would be surprised to find out that a lot of what you describe happens in Britain, in Italy, in Greece, and in France. And, and there's a whole literature which doesn't take an ethnographic perspective that looks at these mechanisms and how they mobilize different actors, which I think would enrich some of your thinking there. Um, my question was about um, the notion of regimes of dispossession. I, I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit on this, because in the idea of regime, there's the idea of temporal continuity and intent by actors. And I think in your talk, I'm sure it's there in the paper, we didn't get the sense of a long-term sustained coalition and actors that are you know, really geared towards the intent of dispossessing. And I'm sure that within your state bureaucracy, there are planners which are not corrupt or trying not to be and still try to abide by the new Rubin planning ideal versus a new generation of more corrupt men. So there probably are tensions within the state and permanent disagreements, which may mean this concept of a stable regime with a sort of one-sided intent of the state to dispossess might be more complicated in practice. And in relation to this, at the beginning of your talk, you said that one of your arguments in the paper was that the social movement was the social movements were mobilizing planning against in, in a grassroots way. So I wanted to ask you if you could tell us more about this because that's actually really interesting in a way it counteracts the argument you've just made. Um, and I was wondering whether some of the social movements you look at, you know, have built alternative expertise in planning to mobilize the very same regulation that seeks to dispossess them in front of the court, typical process of judicialization, building alternative uh, evidence, for example, mobilizing motions of the public interest. You know, that's a classic arena for social movement to get involved. You, you sort of put forward an alternative definition of what's the public interest, built alternative evidence. So are they mobilizing this very planning that this possesses them successfully in some cases by using some of the clauses hidden somewhere in the law, or just relying on a not corrupt court to judge in their favor by using the racing system? Similar questions in the work this past, but then I now I do have a constellation of kind of thinking that going around about your title, uh, which uh, kind of you know, conveys the disposition without development. So I was wondering, so if you really call without development, it is an accumulation, it is a disposition, but is it without a development? Then we go into the debate of you know whose development, how, like you know, and how that is kind of you know being. Uh, understood by the state itself, by the whole state. So now if you understand state as a kind of you know, machinery of the dominant interest, then we also have to kind of you know, uh, put down that conception of development altogether and say it's a regime of what you call disposition, but it's, it's a regime of disposition by, for accumulation. So will you not agree with the, like you know, changing the title in this disposition uh, for, for the sake of accumulation, not for the development? <clears throat> Interesting talk, thank you. Uh, my question actually pertains to, uh, you know, the Arun Mishra have had a judgment today on the Land Acquisition Act 2013, where going against all this precedent so far, he held that uh, the landowner who refuses to accept the compensation, which is until May 1st, 2014, then would be uh, refused the chance for that cancellation of that. So I was wondering to what extent in your project has the right to fair compensation in most, especially in 2013. Thank you. I mean, thank you so much for both for the drawing our attention to that literature, which which I know exists, and uh, I, I don't mind if it's not sexy as long as it's useful. I think that that's the, the main uh, main quality. Um, so, um, regimes and stability, um, it's, I mean, if we, we do have a kind of black box in the paper in the sense that we, none of us have carried out field work within the planning apparatus. And I mean, it's not easy, but it's not impossible either. So potentially, I mean, Michael Goldman has done very good work in Bangalore on, on these issues, and all the World Bank, not least. No? So uh, it's possible to get access to these domains where such decisions are made. We don't have that kind of material, so so that the constellation of actors and the kind of networks <coughs> that, that drive this and the intentions are, in a sense, not available to us. And 
that's sort of, as an anthropologist, that, that's what I want to know. <laughs> uh, but we don't have that kind of data, so it's, we try to always take a step back and see, okay, what we can see is the outcome of planning processes as they manifest in land use maps and documents and graphs. And so Laden, who has done most of this work, I think he, he's trawled through all these cassettes and picking up these 2,251 different notifications and has done the work on the mapping and all this. So, so that's the kind of data we have. But it, I, I agree with you that this is the kind of data we would have wanted. Uh, um, what we do have, I think, is we have another paper out on, which also go, goes back to your point, which I forgot to address about sort of the individual strong politicians. And, I mean, across India, people will complain about their corrupt politicians, but perhaps in Goa even more so. I think uh, the discourse of corruption is extremely strong there, uh, much more than I'm used to from other places. I'm, I'm used to quite a bit of that. <laughs> uh, but I think in Goa has 40 MLAs, so uh, a Goan constituency is among the smallest in India. It's not, 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 I mean, it's not 100,000 voters in the constituency, it's less, no? Um, on the one hand, that gives a closeness to the local politician, they are much more accessible, and they are much more dependent on a relatively small amount of voters in the constituency. That makes them approachable. On the other hand, they also often function as key persons in a much bigger network. So I think rather than the individual, I mean, what does an individual strong politician do? I think to me he holds together a big network, in a sense. And in Goa they span the bureaucracy, often the mining sector, the taxi unions, uh, the real estate sector. So all this sort of meshes together, uh, which is why I, I, I think one can argue, even though we don't have the insights, that, that there are these sort of alliances and networks that also uh, that that makes having a foothold in the planning department extremely important. Um, so, so that's what I would probably. I mean, the the regime discussion. Um, uh, I think if I don't, if my memory doesn't fail me, I think Mike Levin ends his book about presenting this as a new research agenda. What we need to know is how do all these regimes look in different state contexts. And I don't think as of yet anyone has actually really done that. So this might be a, a, some kind of agenda looking at how can a regime look at a state level. Uh, so, so there are many things that we so far don't know about Goa, but these are some of the contours that we, uh, that we can outline. Yes, uh, movements. I think, I mean, Judicialization, I think, has been very useful in Goa in the context of mining and some other environmental struggles, partly also against infrastructure. I think what's happened, because what, what one might imagine was a kind of people's planning campaign, no? Now we'll do it ourselves. We'll make the maps, we'll make the plans, and we'll throw it back at the government and tell them to obey their own rules. Huh? That would be sort of the appropriation of the planning network by grassroots movements. Uh, it, it's been done mostly to create critique existing planning documents, but I think what's happened in all of these cases is either a withdrawal or a suspension of existing plans before one reached a stage where a sort of a people's planning campaign might have taken off. Um, and how to interpret that I'm a bit unsure of, but as far as I know, um, well, part of the people's planning campaign would, would consist actually in these villages looking at the plans and looking at their own village and then coming up with discrepancies. But that would, I think, first and foremost lead to a withdrawal of an existing plan and a period of suspension, you might say, where no planning is really in effect because they're all withdrawn and then one reverts to an older plan that had also been withdrawn at some point. Um, so it, it's uh, a, different kind, a different kind of social movement and uh, context. Uh, yes, development. Um, I, uh, it's not the title of my book, and uh, um, I, I think I, 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 I see what you're alluding to. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a discussion that I think is, is ongoing. No? I mean, how to think about development in the sense, no? 
accumulation processes versus distribution and all this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I was. Uh, I hadn't heard about uh, what, what you referred to now. Uh, the right to fair compensation, and um, I'm unaware of the extent to which that law has actually been applied yeah. across India. Um, I know the Indian Chambers of Commerce and these federations were extremely unhappy with that law because they claimed it made land acquisitions impossible. So I don't know to what extent uh, land acquisitions have been carried out under that act actually. Uh, I know that there are all kinds of state level modifications to that act, uh, mostly in the shape of dilutions of key provisions. I think in the Goan context, um, these are, rather than making a state-specific version of the Right to Compensation Act, uh, these two new acts were in a sense introduced to sideline the <coughs> National Act, uh, which can be done with the assent of the President, uh, even though it contravenes a Union Act. Thank you for that paper. Actually, um, I just put a first a comment. You know, I live in Gurgaon. I can assure you that uh, 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 that uh, Goa. I'm not sure that Goa is much like much more uh, uh, problematic uh, uh, in terms of what happens in terms of uh, 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 land acquisition and what you refer to as disposition. Actually, my, my broader question is about whenever I, ha I, ha I hear the term neoliberalism, I wonder what it means. Um, what is it that you're comparing it with? Um, because at one level, of course, it present, it ends up becoming a dominant ideology thesis that you can actually explain a number of effects through one cause. So in that, it's very functional. Step. So I wonder if through the term, invo through invoking the idea of neoliberalism, which through which we explain universities and roads and Bollywood weddings and a whole range of things, and as soon as you say use the term neoliberalism. The audience knows exactly what you mean. So whenever you have a term like that, I wonder what use it has anymore, where we are completely agreed on what it is that we are talking. We don't, you don't have, even have to explain what it means. So my question is that when this, you know, I mean, really historically, not more than nine to ten percent of this kind of disposition that you're describing has been done in the private sector, as you said, you said, you said and ninety percent actually by the state, as you said, steel city and dams, etc. In the earlier instances of land acquisition, um, there was almost no recompense at all. There were no activists at all. Um, so I'm trying to understand what the difference is between the pre, if I you call it pre neoliberal dispossession, and the neoliberal, and, 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 and the contemporary uh, neoliberal, uh, uh, this sort of the neoliberal disposition. Because I mean, I'm really wary now of arguments which seem to me to take the state as a cipher, and the state has itself. Nothing, it's just it's like an elite takeover model that dominates your ideology. So that is about government. But I think what would be really interesting to put is not about the government, but governmentality, which is quite different from I mean, what has happened to the state, what's its relationship with private capital. Because otherwise, really, this explanation, I think it's a really fascinating project, mm -hmm. but the book that you described really goes back to a very older model of how we understand uh, um, the relationship between capital and land, which if you look at contemporary work in real estate, the cultures of real estate in India uh, give you very different, uh, contemporary ethnographic work. Uh, there's a very recent work, in fact, um, on, on the cultures of real estate, um, mm -hmm. which give you really interesting ideas about the changing nature of the state and its relationship with capital. And mm -hmm. really, so, you know, I'm just trying to think of struggle with the notion of what neoliberalism can actually tell us, uh, apart from a really a very old idea of what we think is a dominant ideology and how the state has been taken over. Uh, because what, what ends up happening in this, in, 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 not in your presentation, in general, I think is the people are always being acted upon, constantly. And that's, uh, I mean, you know, the question we need to ask is not so much why shopping malls uh, uh, have environmental impact, why do people love shopping malls?
That's an ethnographic question. That neoliberalism has a term can't, can't tell us. So, I mean, that's what, what do you think is the difference between the older model? Because the older model, in fact, no one was compensated at all. People, indigenous population got thrown off when the steel cities were built. There were no activists. So what do you see is the fundamental difference? Okay, Ken. Yes, these are big questions. I mean, I, on the one hand, I agree with you. I mean, it, it's as if nothing happens in India anymore. No, it all happens in so neoliberal so India. This is not <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I am. I mean, <coughs> my own sort of thinking about this goes probably back to Kohli's idea about the sort of the state, the, the relatively narrow social basis of the pro-business turn of the state, uh, which I think probably gives the, the I mean, his, his take would be it has, it, it's a narrower sort of social base of the state compared to what we've seen before. And his, no, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, I, I think it, I think you're right that it's important not, I mean, not to use sort of neoliberalism as a kind of blanket term, but I think that's enough work on sort of varieties of neoliberalism and its context-specific manifestations from critical geography that I think allows us to retain it as a more or less useful concept. I think the, the, the going back to, um, I mean, the explanation that, that Mike offers in his book about the relative, well, it was maybe not so much an absence of protests on the sort of the old regime from people who were dispossessed, but a lack of actors who were willing to pick it up, in a sense. Um, and whether one would explain <coughs> that with sort of, the, sort of the hegemonic role of the early post-independence Nehruvian state, uh, I mean, these are explanations that are around, no? That, that, that this was, I mean, you had a state that carried over that kind of legitimacy uh, from the pre-colonial uh, independence movement. Um, why do people like shopping malls? I think that's, um, th this is, I mean, uh, something that interests me as well, perhaps not really shopping malls, but sort of the, sort of the aspirations that are, that, that people have, no? And where they come from, and also how they align with or contest the broader political economy and the kinds of ideas and images that produces. I think that's an interesting research agenda. And one of the things we talked about in, I mean, and that I've always been a bit uncomfortable with in this paper too, is that in one sense it gives the impression of perhaps operating with a sort of more crude, cruder Marxist version of how things work now. Uh, an evident state business alliance and that that acts upon and triggers certain kinds of social mobilization where people are not particularly the makers of, of what they <coughs> do in life. Uh, it, I think in this case it's not entirely without an empirical foundation. I think this, I mean I'm speaking now about the particularities of the Goan context, I think that constellation is pretty strong in Goa. What we do not cover in this paper, and what I think uh, requires more empirical work, but which might also ethnographically answer some of the questions you pose now, is a good number of everyday goans that have also approached the town and country planning department asking to have their agricultural plots converted into settlement zones. Okay. Uh, to set it off, to build a bed and breakfast uh, house. All these kinds of everyday economic opportunities that also feed into a conjuncture that also has to do with the long decline of agriculture in the state and all the, uh, the tenancy laws of the 60s that, that both freed up tenants but also at the same time undermined cultivation. That's a much bigger conjuncture, I think. And I think if one wants to look at these everyday aspirations and how they resonate with one or the other kind of hegemony, uh, I think that makes for interesting ethnographic projects. Uh, it's not something we had the chance to do in this particular paper, but it's, it's, uh, I, I think we are, 
put on the same page in terms of, sort of the ethnographic value of that kind of research. In fact, just to point out, I mean, there are corners of the book that uh, yeah, yeah. just out. Yeah. 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 Kind of, uh, yeah, I'm thinking there's a book yeah. called The Landscapes of Aspiration, which is an ethnography of real estate industry. Yeah, I'm familiar with that. That's the Lirina Soil monograph. Yeah. 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 Can I just say thank you so much, Kenneth, for coming and for changing your travel plans to accommodate <laughs> our strike. Uh, this was huge happy yesterday, so thank you so much for that. Thanks once again for, uh, for coming, all of you, and uh, let's give you uh, a